everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is Chapter 9, Molecular Biology on DNA and Gene Expression. Our learning objectives for this chapter include being able to draw a strand of DNA and identify major structural features that relate to DNA's function. Describe how a protein is expressed, starting with DNA in the nucleus, and then relating gene expression to why you have different cells in your body. So what do a human, a mushroom, and an elephant all have in common? So we know that all things have DNA. So, so far we've learned how chromosomes, which contain all your genes, are distributed during cell division. We know that genes influence all the biochemical reactions taking place inside cells, as well as our susceptibility to disease, behavior, lifespan, and behavior. Now, environment is important, but genes provide a basic blueprint for all our possibilities and limitations. Of course, we know we get our genes from our parents. You get it from your mama. You get it from your daddy. Um, but yes, we get all our genes from our parents and they give us our specific uh, traits such as hair color, eye color, skin color, uh, how tall we are, how short we are, and even maybe a little bit of personality as well. We went over our basic structures of the cell. We know that all cells contain a nucleus. Within the nuclei, we have chromosomes, and these chromosomes are made up of DNA, which we get from our parents. Back in the 1900s, there was a race to discover uh, DNA's actual structure. We're going to talk about Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin actually did the research that laid the foundation to support the double helix idea um, that was made that made these the the researchers Watson and Crick famous. Uh, Rosalind Franklin was born in England, and she excelled in science and earned her PhD in chemistry from Cambridge. She then went on to uh, King's College and studied X-ray techniques to study DNA. Now, being a female in her field was challenging at the time. She actually clashed with, with her lab mate, Maurice Wilkins, who thought she was hired to be his assistant at first because, of course, he did. She continued working, and in 1952, took the famous um, photo 51. This is the most famous x-ray image of DNA, which took over a hundred hours and would take about a year to analyze. Now, without Franklin's knowledge, Maurice Wilkins actually took her photo and showed it to Watson and Crick and they used her data. Um, and instead of doing those uh, over a year to analyze her work, they actually did a quick analysis to come up and arrive at the correct double helical model of DNA. They published their model in 1953. Now, after her doing her analysis, Franklin also came up with a double helical model of DNA and submitted her work about the same time uh, to the same journal as Watson and Crick. However, that scientific journal put her work after Watson and Crick's and made it look as though her research supported their work instead of being the original data that inspired that model. Now, unfortunately, Franklin died in 1958 from cancer, never knowing that Watson and Crick had used her photograph for their research. So she was never really given uh, the notoriety or the same notoriety as Watson and Crick, even though she did deserve it. If you want to watch more about uh, that story, you can go to this YouTube link uh, and find out more about Rosalind Franklin. So here we see a picture of Watson and Crick and uh, their model that they came up with um, based on the work that uh, Rosalind Franklin did in the X-ray lab. So uh, the discovery of the model of DNA was in 1953. Now, based on this research, uh, we have some big ideas. So big idea number one, the structure of two DNA molecules together 
is what's called a double helix, uh, just like this fabulous helical staircase. We talked about DNA um, being made up of monomers we, when we talked about large uh, biomolecules earlier this semester. So we know that DNA is made up of nucleotides, and nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids. We know that each nucleotide consists of a sugar, uh, usually a five carbon sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So here is the structure. Um, of a nucleotide. We have our five carbon sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose. We have our nitrogenous base as well as our phosphate group. Now nucleotides have one of four nitrogenous bases. We have adenine, uh, which we use the letter, capital letter A to symbolize. There's thymine, uh, symbolized by capital letter T. We have guanine, which is symbolized by capital letter G, and cytosine, symbolized by capital letter C. Now we divide these nucleotides um, into purines and pyrimidines. A way to remember purines is to remember the mnemonic pure as gold. So pure as gold gold. So pure, standing for purines, and then we have adenine and guanine are the, the purines. Uh, so the pyrimidines uh, include the other two um, bases, which are thymine and cytosine. And we know that thymine pairs up um, or bonds with adenine and cytosine uh, forms a bond with guanine. So the purines and pyrimidines form a bond with one another. So how do the two strands of DNA, DNA stay together? We have complementary hydrogen bonding between those nucleotides, between the purines and the pyrimidines. Complementary means there is exclusive bonding of each base with with only one other base. We know that adenine always binds uh, with thymine and cytosine always bonds with guanine. And between the two nucleotides are hydrogen bonds, which we've talked about earlier this semester. Another big idea is that the structure of DNA is key to its function. So it must be replicated when a cell is ready to divide, and it must be read to produce the molecules, such as proteins, to carry out the function of the cell. Now, for these reasons, DNA is protected and packaged in very specific ways. Uh, so we have our sugar phosphate backbones. We have base pairing um, between the purines and pyrimidines joined by hydrogen bonds. Uh, and we can see that the hydrogen bonds in DNA act like zippers. And we have specific enzymes that will unzip these uh, hydrogen bonds. And we can see here uh, the unzipping of the two sugar phosphate backbones uh, due to uh, the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs being unzipped. Uh, as the unzipping occurs, we can see that there are nucleotides about to be added to each new strand. So how does DNA do this? How does it store information? How does it duplicate itself so easily? So first we're going to look at how DNA stores information. First, let's think about the alphabet. Um, we're going to get into the different nitrogenous bases. DNA alphabet has four letters. We have A, T, C, and G. Now these will create three letter words. Uh, these three letter words, also known as codons, um, form amino acids. These amino acids, which we've talked about during digestion, um, are the building blocks for proteins. And we know that proteins uh, are numerous. About We have billions of proteins of different organisms. 
So we know that DNA stores information in the order of the nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. Now, how does DNA duplicate itself so easily? Well, not that easily, but easily. Uh, DNA replication is the natural process by which cells make an identical copy of a chromosome. And we've talked about replication during the cell cycle. And when does DNA replicate itself? If, remember, if we remember our cell cycle, we know that DNA replicates itself during interphase, specifically the S or synthesis phase. So the basic idea of DNA replication, we have the parent molecule, which has two complementary DNA strands. We know that the bases pair uh, with one another uh, through hydrogen bonding. We know that adenine binds or bonds with thymine, guanine bonds with cytosine. We have a specific enzyme called DNA helicase. Anything that ends in A's indicates an enzyme. So DNA helicase is that enzyme that will unzip the DNA. So it will break those hydrogen bonds between uh, the, the nitrogenous bases. So uh, as we see in this little meme, if I were an enzyme, enzyme, I'd be the DNA helicase so I could unzip your genes. Very funny and not creepy at all. So we consider the parental strands as templates that will determine the base order. We have another enzyme called DNA polymerase, which will add the bases to the uh, parental templates. So at the end of replication, each daughter DNA molecule consists of one parental strand and one new strand. Okay, so first we'll have unzipping of the DNA into two uh, template strands, and that is done by uh, DNA helicase. Then we have adding of bases by another enzyme, which is DNA polymerase. Um, to form uh, one new strand. This is what happens, or this is the end product of replication. So here we see um, the parental template strand on either side, and after DNA polymerase has done its job, it has added complementary bases, which forms one new strand. So here is a really good video which will help uh, review the process of DNA replication. So here are some interesting facts. It takes about eight hours for one of your cells to copy all of its DNA. Our entire DNA sequence is called a genome and there is an estimated three billion DNA bases. This would take up about three gigabytes of storage. And if you could type 60 words per minute, 80 hours per day, it would take you about 50 years to type this. So one of the problems that you'll be faced with is being able to replicate DNA. So do you think you can replicate this piece of DNA? So we have our nitrogenous bases and we need to add the complementary base pairs. So you can use one color to represent the original strand and another to represent the new strand. So adding our complementary basis, uh, we add a thymine to the adenine, an adenine to the thymine, a cytosine to the guanine, cytosine to the guanine, cytosine to the guanine, uh, the guanine to the cytosine, adenine to the thymine, adenine to the thymine, and thymine to the adenine. So again, um, here is the challenge to uh, replicate this piece of DNA, adding the uh, complementary base pairs. So if we have ATG, GGC, TTA, it would then uh, add the TAC to 
this uh, code on here. We would then add CCG to this code on here. And then we would add AAT to this codon here. Now, a codon is made up of three nitrogenous bases. And a codon will eventually, um, it will eventually be translated into a protein, which we'll see in just a little bit. So let's take a look at this next uh, piece of DNA. So ATG would be TAC, GGC would be CCG, and then TTA would be AAT. And then this third piece of DNA, ATG would be TAC, GGC would be CCG, and then TTA would be AAT. Okay, so basically replicating this piece of DNA is just adding its complementary base to the template strand. So another big idea is that DNA sequences that code for proteins are called genes. If your genome were a small library, your genes are like sentences in those books. For example, it was a dark and stormy night. Now the human genome is estimated to contain about 20,000 to 30,000 genes. Comparing that to other species, we know that Yeast has about 6,000 genes, a worm has about 19,000 genes, a mouse might have 40,000 genes, and a fly uh, would have 13,600 genes. So human genomes um, with the amount of genes are about the same number of genes as the mouse genome, but about half as many genes as the rice genome. Now what percentage of human genome that means all the nucleotides in all 46 chromosomes in a typical cell in your body, do you predict codes for proteins? If we have about, you know, almost 30,000, what percentage would code for proteins? The correct answer to that is only about 1.5% of your DNA. So your DNA, meaning the 3 billion base pairs that make up the human genome, are the genes that code for proteins. So what do we do with that other 98.5%? So this 98.5%, um, um, it's not junk. I mean, it's not considered junk DNA, but it's considered non-coding DNA. And non-coding DNA is actually something that we're still trying to figure out. It's known as a mystery box of modern biology. It's a mystery, we don't know. But we're still doing the research to figure out what those genes do. So another big idea is that genes uh, code for proteins, which eventually make up our traits. So our genes encode proteins, and proteins are what give us our traits, the color of our skin, uh, the type of hair we have, the widow's peak, other traits that we've talked about, whether or not you can roll your tongue, whether your earlobes are attached. So these are all traits that are, um, that are encoded by our genes into proteins. So our DNA contains genes. And again, these genes encode proteins, and proteins are what give us our traits. So what is gene expression? Gene expression, also known as making proteins. So the genes that are expressed are what uh, the proteins uh, that actually bring about our traits. So if all your cells have the same DNA, then how do you have different cells? We know that all of our cells have the same genome. Well, all but one below. And how do they become different? How do they differentiate? So for example, uh, we have cells that become muscles. We have our three different types of muscle cells, our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our skeletal muscle. We have cells that form um, our germ cells, such as sperm cells and egg cells. We have our blood cells, either red blood cells or our white blood cells and we have cells that form our neurons or nerve cells 
We have this idea that different cells do have the same DNA, but express or make different proteins. So for example, we have a nerve cell or a neuron and we have our cheek cells um, that are, are found in our cheeks. So the cells in our body do contain the same DNA, but different cells will build or express different sets of proteins. And it's these different proteins that give each cell unique structures and functions. So we know that we have two daughter cells containing identical sets of DNA. However, one cell will have expression of a neuron-specific gene to form a neuron or nerve cell. Another cell uh, will have the expression of epithelial-specific genes, which will end up expressing uh, ep the epithelium of a skin cell. So cells with, a, with, cells with the same DNA will become different by turning on or turning off certain genes. So if we turn on certain genes, we get red blood cells. And if we turn off certain genes, we may get neurons or nerve cells. Now the idea of turning genes on and off is what forms the basis of gene expression. So if we turn on a gene, this is um, the trait that will be expressed. And if we turn off a gene, this is the trait that will not be expressed. So how do the instructions in our DNA or genes direct the building of our proteins? Well, we have a sequence of events that will end up uh, allowing us to form certain proteins to produce that trait. First, we have to have our original gene. Uh, from our gene, we form messenger RNA. Um, this messenger RNA, uh, this uh, signal or message will then be turned into a protein um, and that protein uh, is, will form the trait that will be expressed. So here we have uh, messenger RNA. That messenger RNA will then be uh, translated to form a protein that will produce the traits, such as uh, physical, behavioral, um, or medical traits. This idea was termed the central dogma, uh, and this was this idea was uh, brought about by the research of Francis and Crick, uh, by Francis Crick in 1956. So we have our original DNA, our genes. From there, they will be transcribed uh, into our messenger RNA. When we talked about creating those um, complementary bases before, we have transcription of the template DNA into messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA will then be translated um, using a ribosome, one of those organelles that we talked about uh, earlier in this semester. Uh, we, knew, we know that ribosomes are responsible for making proteins. So within the ribosome, we have translation of that messenger RNA to form the protein. Uh, and that protein, again, will be what is going to be expressed in our traits. So how do we get from DNA to RNA? We have what's known as transcription. And again, we talked about adding complementary base pairs to the uh, parent template strand. So this transcription is done by the enzyme RNA polymerase. So using RNA polymerase, uh, we take DNA and then we form RNA. So we know that uh, usually a thymine pairs with an adenine, a guanine pairs with a cytosine, and a cytosine pairs with a guanine. However, with RNA, uh, we don't have thymine. We instead have uracil. So adenine will pair with uracil. And this is how we have transcription. So transcription means to make a copy of something. 
So going from DNA to RNA, uh, we're going to be able to add the complementary base pairs to form RNA. So for example, let's transcribe the piece of DNA below. Oops. So usually adenine will be uh, bonded with thymine. However, if we're forming RNA, instead we are going to be using uracil. So adenine will bond with uracil. Thymine bond with adenine. Thymine will bond with adenine. So that is our first codon. Next, we have cytosine bonding with guanine. Guanine bonding with cytosine. Cytosine bonding with guanine. And then we add to ATG, we have our uracil, then we have our adenine, and then our cytosine. And then this third codon, we have guanine, we have adenine, and then we have uracil. So that's how we would tr transcribe the DNA into RNA. So how do we go from messenger RNA to amino acids? So the flow of information is based on a code. We have our DNA template strand. After the DNA helicase unzips uh, the two templates, we would then would transcribe using RNA polymerase and add the complementary nitrogenous base pairs. Now, transcription, which we talked about, is where one of two of the DNA strands or templates is used to make messenger RNA. So after the addition of the complementary base pairs by RNA polymerase, we then have the formation of codons. And it's these codons which will then be translated into proteins. So translation is when the messenger RNA base triplets, known as codons, are read in three letter words. Okay, so for example, UGG will be translated into the amino acid. Uh, this specifically, I believe, is tryptine. And then we have uh, phenylalanine using these uh, three base pairs or this codon. We have glycine uh, using these three nitrogenous base pairs or this one codon. And then we have this one codon which be, will be translated into serine. So each codon specifies the amino acid to be placed at the corresponding position in the polypeptide chain. So poly means many, Peptide is just a fancy term for proteins, so we have a chain that is made up of many proteins. So going from RNA to proteins, again, we have translation, or the reading of codons into amino acids. So each codon um, is translated into a specific amino acid. And this translation is done by ribosomes and uh, transfer RNA. So again, RNA will be um, translated into proteins when we have codons, which are made up of three nucleotides, um, which will code for a specific amino acid. And again, this is known as translation, meaning to change from one language to another, basically like translating a Spanish book into um, an English translation so that you could read it better. So we have what's known as the genetic code, which are a set of rules relating nucleotide sequence to amino acid sequence. So we can see that we have uh, the different uh, nitrogenous bases and ways that they can, uh, they can combine with other bases. So we have the first base, a second base, and a third base. So we have three bases that make up one codon. So for example, if we have the first base as uracil, the second base as uracil, and the third base as uracil, we will form phenylalanine, and so forth. So um, the 
TYR earlier was tyrosine, um, not tryptophan. Sorry about that. Actually, TRP was tryptophan and TYR is tyrosine. So again, um, the bases combine in specific ways and they code for uh, the specific proteins. Okay. We know that the genetic code is universal. Here we can see a tobacco plant expressing a firefly gene, which lights it up. And then here we see a pig expressing a jellyfish gene, uh, where we have specific colors um, that will light up uh, in specific cells. And here comes our old question about whether or not um, the identical twins coming from identical twins will be identical. Um, now we know that those twins, well, based on uh, the, the chapter of meiosis, it's highly likely that their kids will be identical. But now we know that you know, specific genes code for specific proteins producing different traits. So it is highly, we have another uh, answer as to how it is highly unlikely that two sets of identical twins marrying another set of identical twins will have identical babies because we know that um, with transcription and translation, you will not get the exact identical expression of traits um, after translation of parental DNA. So guys, that is the chapter on uh, molecular biology. And that's it.